In the last couple of years, uh, there's something I've been telling my children, um, that growing up is learning to deal with yourself. Uh, I don't know where I came across that idea, but it has seemed to be a fairly good summation of the task of, of maturing. Like, I can't uh, deal, the only person who can deal with me is me, and the only person who can deal with my, my own children's emotions are, are my children. Uh, and I think that's true for, for all of us. Like, we can help each other, we can assist each other, we can be examples to each other, but at the end of the day, growing up is learning to grapple with our own fears and concerns and bad habits. And uh, I say that I, I'm not done growing up because I don't think we ever are. I don't, that doesn't mean I'm a 12 year old that somehow is masquerading as a 44 year old and have y'all fooled. That means I'm 44 and I'm still uh, growing up. I'm still maturing. I'm still learning and, and growing. Uh, I'm not done. I'm not the person that God has called me to be, not yet. And I think that's true not just of individuals. I think that is true of churches. I think that's true of families. I think that's true of any sort of gathering of people. There's maturation and growing up that, that happens. And I think that we see an example of this if we look across the broad scope of, of the Bible. We see the Jewish people, in a sense, growing, growing up, maturing in how they handle their relations. It, we're going we're gonna to be looking at how the Jewish people handle their relations to people who are not Jews, to people who are outside uh, of, of, of the Jewish people. And so we're going to cover that today as a way to get at this idea of growing up and maturing. Starts back with Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy, Deutero Nomos, the second giving of Nomos, the law, uh, as, as the people are about to go into the promised land. And as they go through the River Jordan, they, they come out, and now they are the Jewish people in, in Judea, and, and, and now they're going to live there. And we have this warning in Deuteronomy 7, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupied, and he clears away the many nations before you, the Hittites, Gergashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, when the Lord your God gives them over to you, you must destroy them, make no covenant with them, do not intermarry with them, give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. And so this is the warning they're given as they enter. Like, if you intermingle at this point, you're going to be led astray. And so they have this general approach sort of culturally, of build a wall, keep them out. All the Canaanites and all those other ites that, that were listed there, we'll just use Canaanites, Canaanites as an stand-in for all of them. But there's this sense of like, protect your children, keep your children from marrying their children or else they will be led astray. And this is at the very beginning of the Jewish people in Judea, about 1400 or so B.C., uh, if we jump ahead seven, eight hundred years, the Jewish people have done what Deuteronomy has warned them against. They had built a kingdom, had some kings, just as was described in Deuteronomy, they had gone astray. And the kingdom of Judah had been invaded uh, by Babylon, and their walls had been destroyed, the temple had been destroyed, and they had been taken into exile. And so after 70 years in exile, they, they come back, and they, they've learned their lesson, right? We were warned back when we came into this land that uh, we need to keep these walls up, these boundaries up, or else. And now we've experienced the or else. And so the first thing they're doing as they get back is they're rebuilding the temple, and they're rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And so we read in Ezra 9, this moment as they're rededicating themselves to Torah. The people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons. And, and that's, this is, if you hear the echo of what was in Deuteronomy, we hear it echoed right here in Ezra. And so this is the moment. All who trembled at the word of God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiled gathered, and, and uh, we, they sent away 
the, the wives that had married in. Like, again, it's got to maintain this boundary. They're recommitting to this because they have to maintain the sanctity, the holiness of who they are as God's chosen people. Okay, fast forward another couple centuries, uh, six, seven hundred years, we get to Jesus. And at this point, there is a significant difference that has, has occurred. It took that entire length of time. But what has happened from the year 1400 BC to the year one is that the Jewish people are really, 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 really Jewish. Like, it's sunk in. They are Jewish. And, and so at this point, the Jewish people are just very confident in who they are. And as Jesus begins his ministry, he finds people who are going to be his disciples. And, and what does he say to them? It's in Mark 2. We see an example of this. Jesus went out the side of the sea, the whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them and as he was walking away he saw Levi son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax booth and he said to him what does he say does he say come build walls with me so that we can protect the Jewish people from all those people does he say come like come with me like the Essenes the the Jewish uh, group that goes off in the desert to get away from everyone because they might rub uh, all those losers might rub off and we have to go be pure and be in the desert in the wilderness right does Jesus say let's get away from all these people no Jesus says follow me and it is such an amazing moment because this is the moment that turns from the build walls to protect us from everyone out there to now Jesus says follow me instead of looking out in fear Jesus says follow me and they go and and 11 other guys go with uh, Levi and they go where they've never gone before they meet people they have never met before and yes they're under the limitations of how how far can they go because they're they're walking um but they go, and they don't go in a spirit of fear. They go with a spirit of boldness, because Jesus will go anywhere, and so do they. And, and so the resurrection happens, Easter, the good news of, of, of life, of, of forgiveness occurs, and then Pentecost hits. And the 12 disciples, uh, they've replaced Judas, uh, the 12 disciples are gathered in an upper room and the Holy Spirit moves upon them and, and creates the church and sends them out. He doesn't send them out to build walls and to shove everyone off because we should be afraid of everyone. It sends the, the, the disciples and all those gathered, he sends them out with a boldness to go and to speak to them in their own language. Go to, to them. And then we read how this continues to unfold. And over the next century, we get things like uh, Galatians 1. We read of what the Apostle Paul does. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 1, I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed to me is not of human origin. I did not receive it from a human source. I received it from Jesus Christ. And you have heard of my earlier life, how I persecuted the church. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born, revealed his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. The Gentiles are everyone who's not Jewish. And so this is the moment at which the, the church is hearing that Paul is being sent out amongst the Gentiles to be confidently following Jesus out and not going, not building walls to keep them out, but to, to go out to them to bring them good news. The, the, and this fulfills, it's, it's the great commission Jesus gives, uh, I send you forth, Matthew 28, I send you forth to baptize people and teach them what I've taught you, send you, send you out to all the nations. This change that happens across the history of the Jewish people from 1400 BC up through 100 AD, this is 1500 years that this takes, right? This is not a quick process, right? But the change that happens is a shift from building walls to keep everyone out to following Jesus, and leaving walls behind and following Jesus wherever he goes. And what I see this as is this sort of growing up, this maturing, this becoming more confident in who they are, in their identity, and in the Lord that they, they follow. And it presents different challenges to the people at, at the, the points along the, this story, 
right? Because earlier on, it went, and when you got to build a wall because those people out there are scary, <laughs> the challenge is, is that their people out there are scary, and so a shared concern will bring people together uh, in, in a worry, a concern, a fear about what those people out there are doing. And so the, the concern there is how scary those people out there are. But the, that's, it changes... And at that point, the focus is on who is in and who is out, right? Are you inside the wall, inside part of us? Are you outside the wall, part of them? But then we get to this point where Jesus is saying, follow me, and goes out. And at that point, it's a different challenge about like what the people of faith are doing. It's not about an internal turn to like protect ourselves from everyone out there. And I think the way we think about this difference or one way to think about it is to imagine that campfire when Jesus is gathered with the 12 disciples. When Jesus has that campfire and he is gathered with the 12 disciples, he has some people there who are not exactly set to get along. He has Matthew, a tax collector. And a tax collector in the first century is someone who has made a deal with the Roman government that they will send the Roman government a certain amount of money per year for a geographic area, and everything they can beat out of that, the people of the area above and beyond that amount, they can put in their pocket. And so we have Matthew, a ta tax collector, who's made a deal with the devil, who's made a deal with the Roman Empire, that if, if the Romans are going to invade, if those scary people out there are going to, to occupy Palestine, right, then uh, he might as well make a buck out of it. Right? He might as well get along. And then we have Philip, the fisherman, who is just trying to keep his head down, catch some fish, and, and throw enough uh, taxes to, to the tax collector so that he doesn't get beat. And then we have Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot wanted to get a knife out and cut the throats of anyone who's collaborating with the Roman Empire, like, for example, the tax collector, Matthew. And so if you think about those three people, right, if, if they have all been beckoned to follow me, to follow Jesus. And they're not, like, if, you, if you're going to take this approach, this early Jewish approach of, like, being scared of the people who are threatening them, you could get all three of those people, Matthew, Philip, and Simon, to be scared of, of Roman occupation. That would be a lot easier than what Jesus is asking, asking them to do. What Jesus is asking them to do is follow me and to become more like Jesus. And it means a different thing for each of those three people. Because for Matthew, he's at, Jesus is asking him, follow me, and that means you need to learn to have a moral core. You need to be able to, to see what is wrong with how you are working with the Roman occupation. For Philip, he is what he, Jesus is beckoning Philip to do is to grow a spine and to be willing, willing to stand up and say, this occupation is wrong and it's not what it should be. For Simon, to follow, Jesus for Simon means to put the knife down and not to uh, try to be hurting others in the process of being more faithful to God. They're all beckoned by the same Lord, but because they have such different backgrounds, what they need to do to follow Jesus is going to be different. And I think that's true for us today. And I'm going to show you how I think that plays out, but I need, my, my, need a whiteboard to do that. So I'm going to pull up this whiteboard, and we're going to take... We're going to see if the, I can make this work on camera. So we're going to go over. So if we go back to, uh, let's go back into the Jewish times. The Jewish uh, culture starts with the temple in Jerusalem, and they have the Torah. And so that is the cent center of the, can you see that? Black marker. It should work better this time. Okay, so start thinking about where the Jewish people begin. They have the temple and the Torah. And that is at the center of, of who they are. And if you can't, if this ends up reading backwards, just believe me, that says temple and Torah. And then after that, what they learn when they get to the promised land is that they have to build this wall to keep out the Canaanites. Because 
out here, people are scary. And so there's a very us and them mentality that begins with, with the Jewish people throughout the first majority of the Old Testament. We get to the times of the New Testament, and there's a new sort of wall to hold. Because the new threat are the Romans who are out here, and they're scary. And so you got to keep out the Romans and the Canaanites so that they can be the, the, the temple and the Torah that's in the middle. That's what holds them together. What happens is that Jesus shows up and changes how they're going to do things. So Jesus shows up. Uh, let's see. Yes, you can see that. Jesus shows up and he's got his 12 disciples. One, two, three, four. And as we talked about, they're coming from different places in life. So for them to be pointed towards and following Jesus is going to look different. The zealot needs to, to follow Jesus the, the path he's following is the path of letting go of violence. The path that the tax collector is let, letting go of is letting go of the love of money. The path that the fisherman is following is be able to learn to stand up for himself for the good of the Lord he follows. And so all of them are following the same Lord, but what they need to do is different. The, the actual content of their discipleship is going to differ a little bit. Okay, so they get into the first century, uh, of the, the church. And the first thing that happens is uh, first century Jews, let's put a bunch of first century Jews right here. So all these first century Jews right here, they're able to follow Jesus. And since they all are coming from the same background, for them to follow Jesus, they're going to come, and, and that arrow looks about the same. And the first big fight of the church starts in Acts 15, because the question is, can these first century Gentiles down here follow Jesus? And, and that the struggle was because they're coming from a different, different context, a different point of view, a different background. So for them to just learn to follow Jesus is going to mean something different. All these first century Jews over here, they know the Torah. They know the prophets. They know what, to, they're, what they're looking for in the fulfillment of, of, of the prophets. So virgin birth... Uh, unto us uh, a son is born, all of that. All these people over here, they don't. First century G Gentile. For them, and, and the decision was made in Acts 15, it might be the most consequential decision the church ever made, was to say, for them to follow Jesus will look a little bit different, but they can still follow Jesus. And from there on, it ends up being this continuing uh, que question of how far does this, this go? Because over the centuries, you have different ways of following Jesus pop up. And so you have a bunch of people over here, and we could call that, that's like the Baptist church. Or we come over here, and you can say, this group of Christians over here, we can say they're the Methodists, or a group of Christians over here, and we can say, ah, they're the Lutherans. And they're all pointing towards the same Jesus. But the what they need to do to approach Jesus, they're following the same Lord, but they're, the arc of their discipleship might vary. And I think where this becomes very essential for us to, where it becomes most helpful for us to understand today, is that there are people who are far from Christ. People down here, people who are just unchurched, just nuns, people, for them... To be able to even turn and point to Jesus at all is quite the big deal. Like, for, for me, I'm up here, I think I said this is the Methodist group. For me, like, I've been following Jesus as a Methodist for about 20 years now. And, and so what I'm, what my discipleship, what me following Jesus, Jesus says, follow me to Andy. Andy says, yes, what I'm going to do is going to be different than someone who has to be convinced that there is a God at all. And then there are other groups. There's a group out there that are de-churched, that have left the church. They have left the church for reasons that are good, usually, right? People who have left the church because they've been hurt, right? And so for them to turn towards Jesus um, is to say that God is bigger than 
the church, that there is a God, there's a Lord to follow, and uh, that Lord loves them even when God's church has failed at it. And so when it comes to how we engage with people in our community, how we do that, that the E word, evangelism, right? Uh, this approach is to say people are coming from different places and what they're going to need is going to vary. And any step that they can take closer is wonderful. And what this doesn't have is a sense of us and them. Because if you think about how this unfolds, if following Jesus today, we try to put a, a box around, these are the people who are in the church, here are the people who are not. And they're, they're not following Jesus like I am, so they must be wrong. Like The way that changes how we relate to people is that it makes us fearful of everyone outside that they might be a threat right? they might be a problem and it keep, takes our eyes off of pointing towards Jesus because if I'm worried about what's outside the wall outside the box I'm not as worried about getting closer to, to the one, the Lord that we, we've been told, invited asked to follow this whole way of thinking about things, it's called a uh, centered set, when you're, everything that points towards the center is good, and that's how you evaluate your, your situation, versus bounded set, where you set up boundaries and say who is in and who is, is out. That's how you approach people in, in life. Um, I think this makes a big difference in, in how we view people outside uh, of the church. And I think it's in line with what Jesus says. Jesus says, follow me, and then leads people outside of the synagogue, leads people outside of the church, leads people to go. And anyone who's going to come along, Jesus never sends anyone away. Anyone who comes closer to Jesus is always a gift. Jesus offers food and, and healing. All you have to do is show up and be pointing towards him. And any step towards him is to be cherished and, and welcomed. I don't see in Jesus, I, don't, I see this great transition from worried about walls to keep the, them out to, to, to an invitation to follow me and say, here's where we're going, here's our future. If you take a step closer to me, that's wonderful. This became really essential for me. I've been thinking about it for the last two weeks as I've been going to General Conference, the gathering of Methodists from all over the world. Methodists from all over the world are different. And if I'd spent the last two weeks worried about who was in and who was out, I would probably come back rather angry because people are different. And if I was trying to draw lines, then that's where I'd be, right? Boxes, who's in, who's out? Who's, who should I be afraid of? Who should I be angry with? Who should I cluster with? And, and this, this thinking, you know, there are methods across the world. They're all trying to get closer to Jesus. And because we're all coming from different places, that's going to look different for all of us. Same Lord, different way to get there. In the same way that Simon and Matthew and Levi had to, they had to learn different things to get closer to their Lord. I don't think that is lessening the Lordship of Jesus. I think that's being realistic about the complexities of the lives of the people who are called to follow Jesus. One Lord, many lives, one kingdom. And that means as we go out and we see people who are different, who are weird to us, who are strange to Christ, any step they take to acknowledge that the church might be a place of safety, that there is forgiveness, that there is grace, that there is a God who loves them, any step, any turn towards that is to be celebrated as a good thing and to worry less about a sense of like who's in and who's out membership, but more about our people are lined together to follow the Lord who loved us so much he was willing to die for us and rise to lead us towards his kingdom. Amen.